pray together. Lord, you taught your disciples to pray our Father who art in heaven. How would be your name? Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the power and the glory and the glory forever and ever. Amen. What an amazing thought that we can come to the Lord and say, not my will, Lord, but your will be done. Not what I want, but what you want, Lord. I hope that's your heart. I hope that you can pray that with integrity and honesty. Have your way in me, Lord. You may be seated. Before we get into the message this morning, we get to do a baby dedication. Actually, we get to do three baby dedications. I'm going to invite those couples to come up. These are familiar couples. You see them regularly. They are all are on our staff here as part of our team. And I want to tell just really, just briefly a little bit of, of a story that you guys may or you may not know, but, um, but all three of these families about two years ago experienced uh, uh, miscarriages but knew that God had given them a promise, knew that their heart's desire was to build a family. And so here we are today uh, with the blessings that the God has given them and God has entrusted them. The reason that we dedicate these children is we want to be like Hannah in Scripture. If you read in 1 Samuel, you'll see Hannah who was praying, begging God for a child. And then God gave her that child, and she gave that child back to the Lord. She said, I dedicate this child back to you. And that's what they're doing here today, all three of these couples, saying, thank you, God, for this blessing that you've entrusted these lives to us. God, we are giving them back to you. There's a beautiful promise I read this past week. In Joshua chapter 21, I, I'm pretending like I can see this. I hold on a second. Verse 45. Not one of the Lord's good promises has failed. Every one of them has been fulfilled. And so we want to take just a moment and, and let these families read a verse that they have picked out of Scripture, a verse over each of these children. And so I'm going to let the Diaz family start and pray this or say this verse over little Silas. And it says, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. This is the Yanceys, and this is little Selah. Jeremiah 32, 39 through 40. I will give them singleness of heart and action so that they will always fear me and that all will go well for them and for their children after them. I will make an everlasting covenant with them, and I will never stop doing good to them, and I will inspire them to fear me so that they will never turn away from me. And this is Psalm 62, 5 to 7. 
we chose it as a a prayer that that is Fede's prayer some someday in his life hopefully soon it says yes my soul find rest in god my hope comes from him truly he is my rock and my salvation he is my fortress i will not be shaken my salvation and my honor depend on god he is my mighty rock my refuge Now I want to ask each of you families to respond. Do you now present these children to God, dedicating and promise to bring them up in the nurture and the discipline and the love of the Lord? If so, say we do. With God's help, do you promise to give your child instruction in the teachings of Jesus and guidance in the development of Christ-like character? If so, say we do. Do you commit to pray for this miracle of life that God has entrusted to you to guide him and her so that they follow the example of your lives, that they will come to know Jesus as their Lord and Savior? And then church, I want to ask you as you'll have an opportunity to possibly have these children in nursery and in children's ministry and Awana, eventually even in youth group, will you do your part? in helping these parents by praying for them, supporting them, coming alongside of these children and teach them and instruct them in the ways of the Lord. If so, say we will. Now we want to just pray a prayer of blessing over these families, over these children, as they um, have an incredible, incredible task ahead of them. For any of you that have raised children, you know that it is not an easy task, that it is a daily challenge sometimes, that there is great blessing in it and there is great difficulty in it, but it is worth it. And so let's pray for them. Lord, we just pray over each of these children. God, I pray for little Silas, the third of these children. I pray that... Um, he will be a blessing to their whole family, as I know he will be. Lord, a bit of a surprise, but God, I know that he's not an accident. He's here for a purpose and a reason. And so, God, I pray that he would be a choice man of God. I pray that you would work in him from an early age, protect him, watch over his life. I pray that his older brother and sister will be the good example for him, that they will love him and care for him. And, and actually help him see you, Lord. I pray for Brandy and Brittany that they would be a perfect example, always modeling for him the love of Christ. Lord, even in their failures, I pray that they would point him to you, Lord, your grace and your forgiveness. And so we just pray for Silas, Lord, that he would be a man after your heart. God, we pray for little Selah, Lord, that she would be a woman of God, Lord, I pray that you would watch over, protect her, keep her from the harms of this world. Lord, that you would nurture her and love her, that she would have self-confidence and knowledge of you from an early age, God, that you would instill for her, in her, a love for you, God, that she will not look for people, for others, for acceptance or identity, but Lord, she would find that in you. So Lord, I just pray for Todd and Alicia. We thank you for this incredible blessing that you've given them, Lord. I pray that they just, each and every day, give praise and glory and honor to you for this, Lord. And God, we pray for her. Little Fede, we pray for Rodrigo and Lucy. Lord, this blessing that you've given them after the face of a trial, Lord, that you've given them a promise and you have fulfilled that promise. God, thank you for family that's here and friends that are here. Lord, we know that this child has a huge network of God-fearing people around him. God, I pray that he will um, just 
grow up in the nurture and the love of Christ everywhere he goes. May he just see examples of you. Lord, I pray you would watch over, protect him. Lord, that you would keep him. Lord, all the days of his life, protect him from his youth to his adulthood. Lord, may he be a mighty warrior for you, God. We lift up all these children. Lord, we give them to you. We dedicate them to you. Thanking you, Lord, for the amazing blessing that they are and that they will be to so many. We praise you, God. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. All right, well, they're going to line up and let you hold them afterwards, I guess, something like that. It's going to be a long line. Hey, we're in Romans chapter 7. If you have a Bible, open with me, Romans chapter 7. We're continuing a study that we're calling the road less traveled. So far in this study, Paul has... He's moved from the subject of condemnation, that we are condemned, for all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory, for the wages of those sin is death, condemnation. But he's moved from early on in the book of, about condemnation, he's moved to justification. He's moved to this topic that we are now made right with God through faith. And then in the last couple of weeks, he's moved into this subject of sanctification. Sanctification, this idea that we are being made more like Christ. Each and every day of our life, we can find victory, little steps towards Christ, that we are having victory over sin, that we are walking in obedience to Christ. We are becoming more and more like Christ. Years ago, I was in Gatlinburg, Tennessee. Anybody ever been to Gatlinburg, Tennessee? What a great, fun place. And, and you'll see this often, but there was a guy that was doing um, chainsaw art. Maybe you've seen that somewhere else. And so there's this guy, and he's got this chainsaw, and he's cutting out this amazing piece of art. And at the time, I was doing a lot of tree work. I worked for a tree service, and so I was using a chainsaw a lot. I didn't do things like that. Um, I could make a watermelon slice. That was about all I had with my chainsaw skills. And so I engaged the guy. We started talking. And, and I was just like, how? How do you do this? And so he started kind of telling me his process. He said, I get a piece of wood. And this was kind of weird. He said, I ask the wood what it wants to be. That's the first thing he said. I'm not sure how he gets that response. But once he's determined what it is he's going to make, he said, then it's easy. He said, say, I want to make a bear. I decide I'm going to make, create a bear out of this piece of wood. He said, then it's easy. All I have to do is cut away everything that doesn't look like a bear. It's easy, right? I started thinking about that this week, and I thought, that is what sanctification looks like. When we have put our faith in Christ and he has put his image inside of us, the process of sanctification is when he simply begins to cut away everything that doesn't look like him. It's not an easy process. It's an ongoing process. It's a lifelong process. I've been a Christian for 35 years, and God is still cutting away things in my life that don't look like him. It wasn't long ago I was challenged to um, try to not say anything negative for three days. You know how long I made it? Three hours, maybe. I tried again. I made it maybe another three hours. It's so hard. I, I came to the place where I thought, if I'm going to do this, and I want to do this, it's a challenge that I've accepted. 
I'm probably going to need to go away to the mountains by myself for three days, right? Or I could say, Lord, help me. Help me with this pessimistic, sarcastic attitude that I have sometimes. Cut away, Lord, this negative spirit in me. Cut it away so that I look more like you. Today we come to chapter 7, and Paul talks about this ongoing struggle, this, this battle that wages in us. But here's the good news, is that he doesn't leave us there. He doesn't leave us in the battle. He doesn't leave us in the struggle. That there is victory, and we will see that. So don't, this is a message you don't want to leave early. All right, the fans are back on. Thank you, Jesus. And so stay to the end, because there is victory. There's good news. In 1886, Robert Louis Stevenson, some of you recognize that author, published a novel called The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Maybe a familiar story to you, maybe you read the book, maybe you've seen the film. It's a story of Dr. Henry Jekyll. He creates this potion, and with this potion, it allows him to turn himself into Mr. Edward Hyde. These two men, although the same man, couldn't be any more different than each other. Dr. Jekyll is this nice, respect respectable, helpful doctor, where Mr. Hyde is just a cold-blooded murderer. At first, Dr. Jekyll can control Mr. Hyde, but Eventually, Mr. Hyde just begins to emerge whenever he wants to emerge, begins to overpower. And so this storyline follows this, this struggle of two different personalities vying for control of the same body. Most of us here today can relate somewhat to that struggle. Not in that way, but in a different way. As a Christian, we can relate to a, a struggle between our sinful man and our new creation, our new man. The battle that is waging inside of us. Robert Stevenson, this author, was also a Christian. One day he was asked, where this idea, where did this crazy idea for this book come up from or come from? And he said, I found it in my own nature. As he looked within, as he looked at his own struggle and his own life and this constant control for supremacy in his life. In chapter seven, Paul shares an ongoing struggle. And when you look at it, it, it can be shocking. It can, it can be shocking, so shocking that there's many that want to explain it away and say, no, he's just speaking of his life before Christ. That surely the Apostle Paul wouldn't be that sinful. Surely Mr. Spiritual, the author of, of 13 of the New Testament books, surely he didn't struggle with ongoing sin. But most of us know this struggle all too well. You remember a few years ago when everybody was hashtagging everything? Do you remember that? Everything was hashtag and then just no, no space, no period, just put everything together. And there was this hashtag, the struggle is real. Do you remember that? Some of you are still doing that? The struggle is real. And it was always like somebody with like a piece of chocolate cake. Oh, hashtag the struggle is real. But the struggle is real. Trying to live for God is a struggle that can be difficult. Trying to live what it says in this book. The struggle is real. 
It's so real that I would imagine that, that some people have probably even in this struggle wondered if they're even a Christian. In this battle with sin have said, there's no way that I could, could truly be a Christian and still do these things wrestled with condemnation and can a, str- can a Christian continue to struggle and have strongholds that they, they cycle and they, they can't get free of? Can we have thoughts that are not of the Lord? And the answer to that is we can't. The very fact that there's this struggle is shows us that Christ is at work in us. And so, today I want to look at four reasons for the struggle. Four reasons that we may struggle. The first one we see in verses 12 and 13. And it says, So then the law is holy, and the commandment is holy, righteous, and good. Did that which is good, then become death to me? By no means. Nevertheless, in order that sin might be recognized as sin, it used what is good to bring about my death so that through the commandment, sin might become utterly sinful. The first thing I would say, we struggle because of what we know. We struggle because of what we know. Paul is talking about the law here. He's talking about the commandment that was given to Moses for the children of Israel. And then he gets into, this is earlier in the, in the text, he gets into this relationship that the law still has with Christians, New Testament Christians. We know that the law is good. We know that the law is holy, that the law is right, that the law is just. Now, there's some that would say there's no need for the law. There's some that would say that we're not under the law, that we're under grace. And somehow in saying that, they think that the law is bad. But let me ask you, is it wrong for us to read scripture and to see where it says that we're to love God with all of our heart? No. No, the law is good, and we know that the law is good for three reasons. The law is good because God created the law, and God is good, and so we know the law is good. David said in Psalm 19, verse 7, the law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing my soul. Another reason that the law is good is because it is scripture. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, all scripture is God-breathed and it is useful. That means even the portion of the Bible that we call the law. That part that we try to skip over in our reading plan, right? We're reading through the Bible and we get to Leviticus and we're like, eh, next book. That even that is good. Because all scripture is God breathed and is useful. And then the law is good because it is foundational to our faith. Who came to fulfill the law? Jesus came to fulfill the law. He said on the Sermon of the Mount, I didn't come to destroy the law, but to fulfill the law. As Christians, we have as our foundation Judaism. Judaism is a a part of our foundation as Christians. The part of, or the foundation of Judaism is really the law. And so there's a lot of Christians that try to to ignore this, they get away from this, And, and that would be like living in a house and not knowing what the foundation is. Not caring what the foundation is. We can't lose sight of the fact that that God gave a revelation to the Jewish people. That revelation pointed them to Jesus, and that is the same Jesus that we put our faith in today. I met a guy not too long ago that told me he didn't believe in God, that he didn't need God to be a moral person, he didn't need God to be a good person, that he only believed in the Ten Commandments. 
The interesting thing about that is he couldn't name the Ten Commandments. And if he could name the Ten Commandments, he would have seen that a couple of those commandments tell us that we need to honor God, not put anything else above God. We can't keep a law that we don't know. We can't keep a law of someone who we don't know and respect. One of our distinctives here as a church at Horizon is that we teach verse by verse, chapter by chapter, book by book through God's word. We do that for the purpose of you understanding and knowing. We do that because Paul told the church, I don't want you to be ignorant. I I don't want to be guilty of not giving you the whole counsel of God's word. And so in our 10 years, we've celebrated 10 years now, just last month, we've taught through almost every book in the New Testament. We've taught through many books in the Old Testament. We're doing that so that we have a greater knowledge of God's word. Now, here's the problem is with that knowledge of God's word comes the struggle to live up to it. The more that we know God and his word, the more we see our sin and how far we've fallen short. God sets a high standard, a standard that we cannot reach on our own. And the solution for that is what? It's Jesus. Because Jesus is the only one who kept the law. He fulfilled the law. Galatians chapter 3 verse 24 says, So the law was our tutor until Christ came that we might be justified by faith. The law points us to Jesus. It leads us to Jesus. Spurgeon, the great minister, said, The law reveals to us that we are sinners. If men do not know that they are sinners, they will never see the value of the sin offering. Who's the sin offering? Jesus. There is no healing a man until the law has wounded him. There is no making him alive until the law has slain him. And so we struggle because of what we know. The second reason that we struggle, we see in verse 14. Verse 14 says, We know that the law is spiritual, but I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. Some of your Bibles say that I am carnal. The second reason for this struggle is because of what I am or who I am. We can stand up and say, we agree with David in Psalm 19. We can stand up and say that the law of the Lord is perfect. The problem is, we aren't perfect. We see the law that it is good. The problem is, we're not good. The problem isn't the law. The problem is the lawbreaker. We have any lawbreakers in here today? We're lawbreakers. We know that we should love the Lord with all of our heart, our mind, our soul, and our strength. We know that we should love our neighbor as ourselves. We know these things. These things are good. The law is good. The problem isn't the law. The problem is it's me. The problem is you. The problem is the lawbreaker. This past week, we were having our Bible studies on on Wednesday night, and someone came through a hole in the fence over here in the woods, and they stole a bike, and he just rode off. And so we have cameras, and so we reviewed the cameras, and as we looked at the cameras, one of the guards says, I know that guy. And so they went to his house, and they got the bike back. And we asked him nicely not to do that again and we fixed the hole in the fence. But imagine that we decide, man, we're just gonna throw the book at this guy. He's a repeat offender. We, we wanna just put him under the jail for this, right? And so we take him to court, and the court finds him guilty, 
And sure enough, they throw him in jail for a long time. It would be silly for that guy to sit in that jail cell and say, you know what the problem is? The problem is the law. No, the problem is you. The problem is that you are breaking the law, that you're not keeping the law. The law shows us the standard in our society. If you break the standard, then you're going to have a problem. The straight edge of the law shows us how crooked we can be. If you look again at verse 14, it says that the law is spiritual. He's saying here that the law is not just physical, but it is spiritual. It doesn't just deal with outward action. It de deals with inward attitudes, the inward man. If we look again at the Sermon of the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus said, you've heard it said of old, do not murder. What is that? That is an outward action. But Jesus said, if you have hatred towards someone, then you're guilty. What is that? That is an inward attitude. He says in this same sermon, not to commit adultery. What is that? That is an outward action. But Jesus said, but I tell you that if you've lusted after someone in your heart, then you're guilty. An inward attitude. These words, these laws are not just governing the outward actions, they are also touching the inward attitudes. And so Jesus is speaking to people who, they know the law, but the problem is that they are interpreting the law as just merely physical. Paul, when he was a Pharisee, he even said, as it pertains to keeping the law, I am perfect. How could he say that? Because he was only looking at his outward actions. He wasn't looking at his inward attitude. If you're in chapter 7, look back with me to verses 7 and 8. Paul says, what shall we say then? Is the law sinful? Certainly not. Nevertheless, I would not have known what sin had, had it not been for the law. For I would not have known what coveting really was if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, seizing the opportunity afforded by the commandment, produced in me every kind of coveting. For apart from the law, sin was dead. Paul uses the example of coveting, the last of the Ten Commandments. And he uses this example to show us our inward attitude and how our inward attitudes can be sinful. Nine of the Ten Commandments are about outward actions. Only the last one, coveting, is addressing the inward attitude. We can look at the Ten Commandments and we can easily, or probably pretty easily, check and say, I'm doing good on most of those. Haven't killed anyone today. Haven't stolen anything today. Haven't used the Lord's name in vain today. We can check a lot of those and say, good. But then when we come to coveting, this is speaking of any illicit thought that I may have towards something or someone. Coveting. When it comes to coveting, I'm guilty. My inner attitude that covets that longs for, that desires things that I do not need and that I should not have has corrupted my inner man. Whether I ever act on it or not, see, so often we want to just judge sin that way. I never acted on it. I never did it. 
where so often the inward attitude has convicted us already. It's an ongoing struggle. And so then we come to the third reason for the struggle we see in verses 15 through 24. And it says, I do not understand what I do. For what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but the sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but the sin living in me that does it. So if I find this law at work, although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind, making me a prisoner of the law of the sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death. The third reason for this struggle is what I do. We struggle because of what we know. We struggle because of who we are. We struggle because of what I do. I wonder as I read that text, can anybody relate to that? I do the things I don't want to do. I do the very things that I hate sometimes. And then we respond with, I don't understand why. I hear that from my boys, it seems like almost daily. Why did you do that? I don't know. Why did you hit your brother? I don't know. Why did you throw spaghetti on the ceiling? I don't know. Why did you close out my computer and all the stuff I was working on? Where is it all? I don't know. We say that sometimes. Why did I do that? I don't know. Why did I say that? don't know and if we're honest we we all have those moments where we do something where we say something and we don't even know why we do it I don't want to do that that's not who I am that's not my character can you relate to that I have made a promise to God before and then found myself breaking it the very next day. Why do I do that? I don't know. And I feel like there is this war that wages in me between my old nature and the new. Galatians chapter 5 verse 17 said, for the flesh desire is what is contrary to the spirit and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other so that you do not do what you want. There are people who will argue that Paul is writing about his life before Christ right here. I read that in commentaries this week that I saw. I heard that from different individuals that this struggle that he is laying out here is simply before he was a believer. And the reason that I believe and many people that I have spoken to and many people that I admire and, and read believe that Paul is speaking of his regenerated life, a life in Christ, the reason I believe it is because it is true in my own life. I know that I'm a Christian. I know that I'm a believer. But I also know that I struggle. And if we are honest, we can probably relate to the struggle of Paul. To realize it's not easy, that there is a battle in us. There is a Jekyll and there is a Hyde within us fighting for power, fighting for control. Now, 
this is not an excuse to be sinful. If anything, this should give us a notice to be mindful. It should be an incentive to be careful. We don't want to stop right here. This is not the Christian story. There's more to the story. Don't just say, well, this is my life. I'm destined to just keep doing it. I don't want to do it, but I just keep doing it. I don't know why. Struggle is real. No, there's victory. There is victory over sin. We don't have to wallow in the struggle. If you have a resurrected life, stop playing in the cemetery. Have you ever had a washing machine or maybe seen a washing machine that gets stuck in the spin cycle and it just keeps going and it just keeps going and it's not going to shut down. It just keeps going and keeps going. There are Christians that get caught in the sin cycle. They won't stop. They just keep going. They're like... It's like sitting in a rocking chair when you look at their life. There's a lot going on. There's a lot of motion, but there's no forward progress. Now, we all love rocking chairs, right? It's fun to sit in the rocking chair. It's comfortable in the rocking chair. But you don't want to be in the rocking chair when it comes to your Christian life. You don't want to just have a lot of motion but no forward progress. We want to break the cycle. It's not easy. It's not comfortable, but it's necessary. And then we come to the last point. The fourth reason that we struggle, we see in verse 24, and we're going to go into chapter 8 just a little bit. And it says, what wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of sin that is subject to death? I just feel Paul's exhaustion right there. He's at the end of his rope. He's struggled enough, and he cries out to God. And then in verse 25, it says, thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then I myself and my mind am a slave to God's law, but in my sinful nature, a slave to the law of sin. Therefore, there is now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his Son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be a sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us. We do not live according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Paul has cried out to be rid of this Mr. Hyde in his life. And to, in order to be free from it, he needed a source that was beyond his own ability. And so verse 25 says, thanks be to God who delivers me. You know what my favorite part of chapter 7 is? Is that it's followed by chapter 8. Because if Romans only had seven books, I don't think we'd be studying it today. It would be a tough read. It would be really difficult just to end in the struggle But we also struggle because we know what is possible. There is good news. We see that in chapter, at the end of the chapter, we see it going into verse 8. That there's no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. There's some people in here that maybe you're part of AA or maybe you know someone who's a part of AA. There's some principles from AA that I think could be really helpful when it comes to applying them to our struggle with sin. In AA, the first thing you have to do is you have to admit that there's a problem, right? Start the meeting with 
sharing your name and admitting that you're an alcoholic. The second principle I see in AA is that you need accountability. We're going to surround you with people around you. They're going to help you. They're going to build you up. And the third principle I see in AA is that they say you need a higher power. Guys, when it comes to our struggle with sin, we need to admit, first and foremost, we have a problem. We do that by confession, confessing it. The second principle is we need people around us. We need the church. We need brothers and sisters that will hold us accountable, that will speak truth into our life, that will push us towards action. And then we need not just a higher power, we need the highest power. We need the Spirit of God to dwell in us, to empower us to live for Him. Verse 4 says the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us. Notice it doesn't say that the, the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met by us. It says in us. It's met in us by Jesus Christ. In church, who saved you? It's not a trick question. It wasn't your mama. It wasn't your preacher. God saved you. And if God saved you, can we not trust God to sanctify us? That he is working. There's a struggle. There's a struggle because of what we know. There's a struggle because of who we are. There's a struggle because of what I do. There's a struggle because of what I can be. Because of what is possible. But know this, church. That you are not fighting for victory. You're fighting from a place of victory. If you've already put your faith in Christ, the victory has been won. The enemy has been defeated. And so when you struggle, when you fight in this, know that you are fighting from a place of victory. Walk in the victory. I'm going to close with these two thoughts. Worship team can come back up as we get ready to close our service. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 says, So I say this, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of your flesh. The victory in this struggle we need is going to come when we begin to walk in the Spirit. Walk in the Spirit. That means we're spending time in God's Word. We're spending time in prayer. We're spending time in Bible study. When we begin to walk in the Spirit, so often we're so busy with these things in the world that we don't have time for these things in the spirit. I want to challenge you to move your location. To walk in the spirit. So you don't have time. And you will not gratify the desire of the flesh. And the second key to victory. Is to know that there is hope. You're not hopeless. You may have struggled with it for a long time. It may be a habit that will be hard to break. But there is hope. Philippians chapter 4 verse 13 says, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. Oh, if you're trying to pull yourself up by the bootstraps, if you're trying to do it on your own, you are going to be frustrated. You're going to be in the cycle for a long time. But through Christ, all things are possible. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for these truths. God, we thank you that you are a God that doesn't abandon us in our struggle, that you are there to pull us through. God, I pray that our eyes would be open for things that stand between us and you, things that you call sin. God, that we would admit that we have a problem 
for the purpose of being able to deal with it and move beyond it. God, I pray that just from the simple truths that we looked at today, there would be chains broken. There would be people set free. People set free from bondage that maybe they just felt like was going to be a part of their life for the rest of their life. God, you came to set the captive free. I pray if someone is stuck in the sin cycle, that today they would look to you, Lord. They would find freedom and deliverance in you. God, there's hope, and the hope is you. We put our trust in you. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together. Hey, as we close our service, I want to give you an opportunity to respond. This is our final thing this morning. We're just going to take three, maybe five minutes. We're going to sing a closing song. We're going to have a time of prayer. Some of our prayer team will be up here in the front. If the Lord is speaking to you, maybe it's something that you need to deal with. Maybe it's a, a loved one. Maybe it's a friend that you want to intercede for them, that this sin would be broken in their life. Let's turn that to the Lord. Let's give it to him. The one that can do all things has the power to do all things. Let's pray together.
I pray as you go this week that you will be breathing in God's grace, that you would be experiencing in every area of your life where once there was condemnation. I pray this week you receive God's grace because God says there is no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. Hey, we're going to stick around here for just a minute. We're going to continue to pray. So if we can pray for you, let us do that. We're going to dismiss now. May the grace of God and the peace of God rest on you this week. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Go in peace.